It's good to be with you. Thank you so much for, for coming. You have a great home, spiritual home. I heard Father Brown was explaining how close it is to the campus. So that, that's quite an advantage. A lot of memories that come like this flood of memories because student centers are very important. And just they have some great ones on so many wonderful university campuses here in Texas. So just a little bit about myself. I grew up about three and a half hours from here, right about a mile from the water. I, so my whole life has been about salt water in the bay. And so I grew up doing water sports and I still I paddle board now, but not in the salt water, I do it in freshwater lakes. But I do, I love it. So with jet skiing and water skiing and all those kind of things, because that's what we, that was our backyard, so to speak. So fishing and these, those kind of things has been important, but most of all just nature itself. Just, I find God's presence in nature. So I, I'm just a real outdoor freak. I'd just rather be outside than anywhere else. And with that understanding, just have, I have a brother, I have two sisters, my, my dad died at a young age of brain cancer. My mom is still alive. She's 80, almost 88 years old. Still mows her yard. <laughs> See, I, I go at home when I can and pull the weeds, etc. But I said, Mom, I'm coming. I'll, I'll do the yard. And of course, the yard's already done by the time I get there. So she has this incredible energy, and this tenacity about her, about her life. She fought cancer bravely, courageously. I would go and check on her. At the time, she lived in my parish when I was pastor there at that time in her community. And I'd go and check on her and every day. She was sitting on a chair. She'd get out of bed, put on a little makeup, even though she felt like, you know what? And she sat in her chair. She says, I'm not going to be sick. And so I really think it was her prayer and her determination that healed her in so many ways. And so that's kind of my my background in terms of just this, this energy, faith-filled Czech family, and we were, we were very close-knit. And so I went to, I, my dream, we all went to junior college. My parents had struggled financially, so it was cheaper that way. We worked, bought our own car, et cetera, but they, they helped us as much as they could. And as I said, in the homily at Mass today, my dream was to go to UT in Austin. And it was a great experience until it wasn't. Until I realized that everything that I thought I wanted in my life really wasn't what God wanted for my life. So like Jonah, I kind of ran. I always thought, since I was a little boy, I always thought about the priesthood. I used to play Mass. My little sister, who's six years younger than I am, she would have to go to, she would have to quote unquote, go to Mass. And so I would make her play church with me. So by the time she was in kindergarten, she probably had been more to more Masses than any adult ever. <laughs> So she would bring her doll, and then after a while, she was old enough to get the trick going off. She would, she would claim that her doll was crying, so she had to go to the cry room. <laughs> so she left the church. But we're real close, and, and my family's always been real supportive of my vocation. I never felt pressured. I never felt like, oh, that's just the only thing you can ever do in your life. They talk, I talked about a lot of things that I wanted to do. Um, I dated for a while, and I had a girlfriend that was really a special person, lives way across the country now. So like once a year we remember we still remember each other's birthdays. Her birthday is October 17th. I always remember her birthday. You know. But I realized there was still something missing. But I thought, well you know UT's gonna solve it. I'm gonna get to college and, and I'm gonna live a good life and I'm gonna be independent and and then that's when God really started working on me was at the university. When I didn't have to go to Mass, no one was looking just like you. No one's getting you out of bed to go to Mass. If you choose, you choose of your own free will. I think that's where it becomes more meaningful. And in that kind of way, that's when I started going every day. Because for me, Mass brought direction to my life. Because I was searching. I was searching so many ways. There had to be some answers, I felt. I, I just couldn't be. My whole life, I was decisive. I knew exactly what I wanted. That's my personality type. I don't know if some of you would come like that. It's like, I'm a list man, I got things planned. I know what I'm gonna to do tomorrow because I've already planned it today. Until this 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 aching, this this yearning, something was going on. Like I said, I got into McCombs Business School. It was so hard to get into that business school in the 1980s because everyone was doing it. I, I remember working in a little grocery store in Palacios in that little town. I grew up like 3,600 people. Everyone knew everyone's business. 
And so if you sneeze, the neighbor would say, God bless you. I mean, it's, everyone knew us. You know, and if we acted up or something, they would tell our dads. And all of a sudden, being on my own, but working at that little grocery store, I'm like, this is it. When I opened that letter, my mom brought it, even though I was working. She said, this came from UT. And he said, accept it. And it wasn't even that important to me after a while of even looking at that dream. Gosh, I, I would move up in the ranks or have my own company or what, whatever the dream might have been. It's like, I kept going back to the example of my parents who were always serving others. My mom was forever at the church, and she would bring me, and I liked going to church. You know, the cleaning the church, whatever it was, I was there. My dad would mow the yard around the church, never charged. That was his service because that was his spiritual home. The way so many of you take pride in your own college church here at this beautiful student center. It's like, no, that, this is our home, our spiritual home. And every Thanksgiving, we always had someone around the table from the neighborhood. We always had a, a, a woman, a, maybe a woman that lost her husband, or never married us, an older person. There was always someone there, or, or they were preparing plates of food to give to someone to bring before we sat down to our family meal. Because that was important to my parents. It was always about reaching out to others. They taught us, it can't be just about you. You have to see if you're willing to give of yourself to others. And so through that example that came back to me when I was at UT in Austin. And all the partying and my roommate was going out all the time and all the opportunities on the college campus, but it just, it wasn't enough. And so finally, after months of searching, going to Mass almost every day, I realized I had a trial this morning. And I have to say, uh, that was close to 40 years ago for me when I first started. And I, I never had regretted that journey. Did I ever think about it at times, because I've been a priest for more than 33 years, did I ever think about what it would have been like to be married? Of course. But I realized God was calling me to something great, something not better because there's not comparison, but something greater than that in terms of service. And so as a bishop, it's always that reminder. I, I, they gave me a ring when I was ordained. Re, reminded me every day that my spouse was all of you. They are calling me to say that their dad died. Or that their husband was in an accident. Or something happened to a child. In the middle of the night, I had to get dressed and go to the hospital. And sit with them and cry with them. And just listen to them. And that was, has always been the best part of priesthood is that sometimes we think priests are here behind the altar soon. That gives us sustenance. That's how we feed God's people. But the ministry is in the middle of the night sometimes. The ministry is when no one else was allowed in the hospitals. When I worked in Victoria, they allowed priests to go in. And they put the space, I call it the space suit, and they put, I put on everything that was possible, and nothing was showing but my, my eyeballs. And families would weep, knowing that their loved one who was dying or very ill was able to be anointed by Christ. And the opportunity to, to serve in the community as, as one of the chaplains for the police department and ride along with them and, and be on call so they would call me that someone has died. We need you to go with the police officer to tell the family that something happened. The opportunity to, to baptize, the opportunity to be with people in the most joyful times of their life, like weddings, and preparing couples. I, I've witnessed hundreds and hundreds of weddings. I've had thousands of baptisms and, and masses in my life as a priest, 33 years, and I've never grown tired of celebrating the sacraments. Never. And, and sometimes it could be maybe five masses on a day because there's a a wedding, and then there's a funeral, and there's another mass, and sometimes it's a meal. Tired physically, but never lacking in the enthusiasm and the joy of being able to celebrate mass. I love that. To make a real difference in people's lives, and in the council with people. So I went back to school, 
after 10 years of priesthood because I didn't have enough counseling skills. There were people would come in and they were wanting, and I've always been kind of known as a good listener. If, when I was in high school, and it could be 10, 30 at night, and I'm in bed and I'm studying, and you know, my dad's going to and there's a knock on the window, Gary, open up. So I'd go around, it's one of my friends, and like, they broke up with his girlfriend, or, or you know, something happened, and sometimes they were drunk, whatever it was. It was a little bit so, so I've always been a counselor in so many ways. And then as a priest, early on, it's amazing. It's like people trust me because I'm a cop. I have spoken to people on airplanes. I've, I've gone to, as a priest, I've had an opportunity to go so many places in the world, to so many different countries and religious sites, and people in airports, people across the world that don't even, they don't know who I am. They know I'm a priest. And automatically what takes sometimes weeks and weeks of, tr of trust building between a therapist, let's say, and their client, a priest gives it just like that. It's like, they t it's like I don't, you don't know me and I don't know you. And they tell me things. Maybe things that they've never even told anyone else. And so on a mountaintop or, uh, or in an airport or in, on a train or, I mean, it's amazing the places where I've heard confessions or been through counseling sessions with people that says, I just needed someone to listen. And they turn to a priest. That's gratifying. It means that I have to always keep that trust. It means that I have to, to work at who I am and being authentic and being a person of prayer and working through my own issues, of which I have many. But that means never being afraid. And when I fail, like Jesus is trying to tell us today in the readings, he has mercy and he's returned to him. So some of the best opportunities of my priesthood have been found in the confession. When I found a confessor that could hear my sins and to forgive me in the name of Christ, just as I've done that so many times for other people. So in order to do anything in life, and especially you trying to live your faith in a secular world, it was tough for me when I was growing up. It's a lot tougher for you. I recognize that. It's a lot tougher. Why? Because we've changed that much? No. But we have different opportunities. See, some of them, sometimes they're not always the best ones. When I was growing up in that little small town, like I said, we, we had accountability. For me, there was never an option. My brother and my sisters and I, we had to go to Mass every Sunday. Absolutely. We never asked. If my brother came in, if he came in a little tipsy, let's say, at two in the morning uh, on a Saturday or a Sunday morning, uh, he knew there was no question. If you got a hangover or not, you go to Mass. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for my parents giving us that kind of example, but also insist, you know, giving us that also that, those boundaries of saying it's always about God first. So how do you handle living your own faith? And how do you know exactly what God is calling you to do in your life? It begins with, with your relationship with Jesus. Pope Francis says it all the time. We have to encounter Christ. It's not about what we do in terms of loving God. As the Bible reminds us, it's the fact that God has loved us. And I spend a lot of my time as a priest helping people to understand that love. Because I have... From grown men to, to college students to little ones to, to, to women with working or with children, etc. What we all have in common is that when we're really honest with ourselves, so often we, we feel like we don't deserve to be loved. I mean, maybe God doesn't love us. Or I've got to go work real hard at making sure that I can convince God to love me. No. The Word of God is very clear. It's not that you have loved me, it's that I have loved you. And when we believe that and can, can, can truly accept that truth in our life, everything changes. When you wake up every day knowing you're, you are one of the beloved of God, that God loves you that much, not because you worked at it, not because you deserve it, or I, because I don't deserve it, but because God loves us as we are. Not to be someone else that we're not, I spent so many years in my teen years and early adult years trying to be someone that I thought,
God wanted me to be, or that my parents wanted me to be, or my friends wanted me to be, or that I thought I needed to be, until finally I can have that sense of self-acceptance and say, I'm going to be who God has made me to be. And for God, that was enough. And if God wanted me to be someone else, He would have made me someone else. And so when we have that kind of self-acceptance, and that kind of self-esteem in a healthy way, with humility, not about you know, kind of having a bloated sense of ego, but the simplest truth that we are loved by God and God has created us out of that love. Then the work of allowing God to enter our hearts is already there, it's already done. Because we're just opening ourselves up to God. I think that's how we live our faith in a secular, more and more secular world. Well, maybe the same support that I had, you don't have. But you can find it, like in a student center like this. You want to be with like-minded people. But also in the midst of others, friends that you have maybe that are atheists, or they think they are. That's kind of the fad nowadays. They don't want to be like, whatever, you know, I, I doubt it. But, you know, they don't know what else. But, but you can witness to them. Ours isn't to try to convert people or change people, but it is to evangelize. And the best way to evangelize is to witness. And we just live our faith. That's what my parents did in their simple way. My dad had an eighth grade education. Okay? He, he was from a very poor family. He was one of nine children on a little farm. You know, like a hundred acres trying to feed all of these mouths. And so he had these great sense of values. But he was such a witness to, to, to us, to his children, and to his community. Be, not because he had degrees on the wall, but because he had common sense. He was a hard worker. He loved Jesus. His faith was important. I think that's what he taught us, those values. So you stay strong in your relationship with Christ. You can make decisions that God is asking you to make, or the world is asking you to make, or someone else is. But most importantly, it's like, what direction do you take in your life? Who are you going to be in light of the love that God has for you? And so as vocation director for the Archdiocese, which I get to do again, as I did in the 1990s, I get to do it again, is walk in the journey with, with people your ages that are thinking about service, that maybe they, they don't feel really called to marriage and think about it, but they can't see themselves in a marriage, but that they think maybe I'm to, supposed to be in a relationship with other people and, and being able to serve them. And I think it's amazing how, if you hear the stories of the 19 seminarians, ask Javier and Diego to tell you their story. They have great vocation stories. But all of them do. And that's one of my favorite things to do, is to, to listen to stories of people. How did, you, how did you know God was calling you to be a priest? And, and knowing that when we have that relationship with Christ, regardless of how secular the world is, we can still stay strong. And still make those decisions that, that God is asking us and assuring that He will help us to do it. So I think working, having that sense of self-awareness is important. Meaning, how who am I as a child of God? And how does my actions, how does my behavior matter? So that self-awareness will lead to self-reflection. So St. Ignatius would say that every day before we go to sleep, it's good to, to examine our conscience, have an examine, daily examine. How did I do today? It's a great way to stay strong in a secular world. Was I nice enough to that person that I, I think was so slow? Because I, I don't know if, about you, but when I go to the grocery store, or I go to HB or Walmart or something, I, I usually get the basket that has a wheel that's broken or something, you know, that kind of makes that sound. I always, I always mess that, that basket up. It's mine. And then I get the slowest checker that has ever existed. And in the bank, I always get the new teller, it seems like. <laughs> and so that means we can sometimes become impatient. And yet, God gives us so many opportunities every day to, to really witness to our faith. So in the evening before we fall asleep, and I'm sure after studying, you've been in class all day, you kind of like me, sometimes you just kind of fall into bed. It's like, this is crazy. But it doesn't take very long. How did I witness to Christ today? Was I, could I have been a little bit kinder to the, to the person that checked our HIV? Could I have been, could I have shown a little bit more patience 
for that child that was crying right behind me while I'm trying to watch this movie? Could, could I have done something that would have made a life a little bit easier today for someone close to me? Did I give up my best, or was I half asleep in class? Was, was I you know, having bad thoughts about my teacher? Or was I ignoring someone, or whatever it is? Is that, could I have done better today? That daily exam helps us to stay strong in our faith. So that's that self-awareness leads to self-reflection. That leads to self-giving. Because if you no one has ever told you this, let me tell you the secret. You ask your parents if I'm not right, because I think I, I'm pretty sure I am. And that is, in marriage, if, if you think priests sacrifice and religious women sacrifice a lot, you ask your parents if they sacrifice in their marriages. You better believe it. And if we have this idea that, gosh, I'm just finding the right, the perfect partner, it's going to be easy. Once we get married, I mean, we get to have sex every night, we're not going to argue, everything's going to be close, we're going to, it's just going to be perfect. It's like, go ask your mom and dad. <laughs> of course there's sacrifice. I've seen it in 33 years of being a priest and counseling with, with couples, and I work in, with a healing ministry in the Catholic Church called Rectory Life. So I, I work, I used to, I'm not allowed to do it now, right now as a bishop, but I would do that and we have weekend retreats in which couples would come and they're, they're in broken relationships. I mean, it's falling apart. I mean, on Friday night when it starts, you know, one is there and the other is there. There's, there's no, you have the arm around and that, are you kidding? And she would slap the arm and the arm went around. It's, some of them are actually divorced. But they're there believing that maybe there's a chance that God is going to heal us. So there's hope. And that's why I like working in that program. And it's amazing through the testimonies and through the work that they do, how on Sunday morning so often that hand might go around the shoulder. And they always, those couples always teach me, uh, if you want a good marriage, you're going to work hard at it. Because you're going to sacrifice. Priesthood, is, there, is it an easy road? It's not. But neither is marriage. Neither is it the call is to be single. Oh, that's okay. You think, oh, that's it. I'm going to be totally independent, etc. There's a lot of sacrifice in that. There's a lot of sacrifice in being a religious man or woman today, living in a congregation. Sister Anna's here, our associate uh, vocation director, so we're glad she's here with, with Anna, the, assist, the administrative assistant that keeps all of us straight <laughs> and everything in order in the office. But, uh, is it always easy, sister, to live in community? No, I mean, it's a young single while all day long and everything is perfect. Yeah, right. it, there's struggles. So how do we stay strong and, and vibrant in our faith and sake of the world? Just to understand about the sacrifice. That's why there's always a cross with a corpus on it in the Catholic Church. That reminder of the sacrifice that Christ has made for us and the fact that through that sacrifice, Christ helps us to carry our own crosses. So there's no sense of perfect vocation. What we all have in common in terms of vocation that comes to us through our baptism is that we're all called to holiness. How you exercise that holiness in your life, it's going to depend. Some of you are going to be married. Some of you are going to remain single. I think there are some right in this room that are called to the priesthood. And maybe you're thinking about it. And, and, and maybe you're, you're, you're running like Jonah from God, but eventually God always wins. Are there women that are thinking about a, a religious life and living in community and prayer and evangelizing in that way? But we all share the call to holiness. And how we live it is by our own choice. I've, it changes over the years. I am not the same person now that I was when I was a priest 33 years ago. I guarantee you, thank goodness. We, we, we mature, we grow, we deepen, but only if we look within ourselves, only if we have that sense of self-awareness, self-reflection, are we able ever to truly do self-giving. Or the church would say self-donation. Husbands and wives in marriage, in a true Christian marriage, have self-donation. They give of themselves. It's not a 50-50 relationship. I've seen husbands you know, carrying 99% of it because his wife is ill or something's happened or, or whatever's going on in her life and vice versa.
for the women that are doing it. It's just, that's the call in those marriage vows. Those are the call, the vows that sister has, the vows that promises that I've made to Father Brian at the priesthood at our ordination. But it's all the call to holiness. So I'm just asking you this evening to think and reflect on that call. How is God calling you to be holy right now? How is He, how is he calling you to evangelize when you're on the campus and in classes? Or when you are maybe, you know, maybe you probably never go to other college students have heard that sometimes they go to bars. I don't know. You probably don't, but some of the college students will. But if you find yourself in a restaurant or you find yourself amongst your friends, including those that maybe don't believe or haven't practiced their faith for a long time, how do you witness to them through your call to holiness? And the more you practice that, the more you're going to find what God's calling you to do for the rest of your life. You're going to discover your vocation, which is simply a word, a Latin word. It comes from the Latin word vocare, which means to call, to call. We all have a call. It begins with the call of holiness through baptism. And through that self-reflection, that self-awareness, that self-donation, giving of ourselves, not living in a self-narcissistic, self-centered way, but trying little ways every day to give of ourselves, God will reveal the vocation that He's given to us. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to live your faith, to practice your faith, to witness to Christ. And don't be afraid to be caught by God, so to speak. Even if you're running from God right now, don't be afraid to be caught. Because God will always catch up with us. But give of yourself and not be afraid of doing so. So that's my prayer for you. And I'd like to come back and see you again.